Welcome. In this third part of our Acts of the Apostles Bible study, we're going to take a look at the account of uh, the Gospel of Luke and his portrayal of the Lord Jesus and compare it with the portrayal of Peter and Paul in Acts. Now, what we hope to do is to see how they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and how it is being by filled with the Holy Spirit that the early church was formed through two different and distinct leaders. Um, to do this, we're going to first turn to the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to go to chapter 22, verses 47 through 41. I'm only going to touch on certain parts of this, and your uh, study guide is going to cover many different examples of this, but we're going to just touch on two for this section and two for the next. Um, so again, chapter 22, verses 47 through 41, where Peter um, will act just as Jesus did. Okay. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and one called Judas, one of the twelve, this is in Gethsemane, uh, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Now let's skip ahead to verse 54. This is where Peter's going to deny Jesus. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. So then Peter's going to go on to deny the Lord three times, and then the cock will crow. And then Peter's going to remember that the word, here we are in verse uh, 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, and he had said to him, Before the cock crows, today you will deny me three times. And he went away and whipped Peter bitterly. Now verses 63 to 65 tell us of the mocking and uh, beating of Jesus. We get to verse 66 where Jesus is brought before the council. This is the, the part that I'd like to touch on and emphasize the most. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together and brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And all of them asked him, Are you the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it from ourselves, from his own lips. Okay, so that's Acts. I'm sorry, Gospel of Luke. Now let's take a look and see what happens to Peter. And see if this is not only probably familiar to us, but maybe it's a familiar scene to him too. Okay, chapter 4 of Luke, of, sorry, of Acts. And here we'll begin um, with the very first verse. I'm sorry, verse 4 of the section that I've accounted for 4, 1 through 22. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So this is one easy way to make them very upset very quickly. And so they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. Now we're going to skip ahead to verse 8. And in verse 8, we will hear that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and asked how this man was healed, let it be known to all of you. And to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Okay, so here we're going to go and jump on to verse 13. In verse 13, we're going to hear, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men. And they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. So, from having denied the Lord at the arrest of the Lord Jesus before the council. Now Peter has not only come to acknowledge him, but to boldly proclaim him before the same council. So Peter was an ear, you need to stop and think about this. Peter was an earshot of what happened to the Lord. So he could have heard everything. And now, not only is he not denying him, but now filled with the spirit, being forgiven, He's now boldly proclaiming something that's likely going to end him up in the same place. So uh, I'll simply say this. If you ever feel like you've denied the Lord like Peter did, okay, that's fine. 
But also remember that after being forgiven and filled with the Spirit, he was able to boldly proclaim the very person who he betrayed. So in God, there's always forgiveness. And there's always an opportunity to continue to boldly proclaim the gospel. And Peter gives us a great example of that and how important the Spirit is in it all. So let's go to another example. Uh, for our second example, I'd like to look at some healing miracles that happened by articles of clothing. So we're going to first turn to Luke, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. Okay, now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. It's a long time. She had spent all she had on physicians. No one could cure her. She came up behind them and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and all press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power came from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, and she declared in the presence of all the people that she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Okay. Now let's look at some similar acts that happened through Peter and Paul. Now for this, we're going to go to Acts. Uh, let's go to chapter 5, verses 4 through 16. And we're going to see how Peter's shadow is going to do some healing. Well, God's going to do some healing through Peter's shadow. Okay. Yet more and more believers were added to the Lord in great number of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. And a great number of people would also gather from towns all around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. So his shadow is going to do some healing. Well, God threw the shadow. Now let's go to one that's kind of a little odd, is Peter uh, Paul's uh, handkerchief. So for this, we're going to turn uh, a couple chapters by to chapter 19. And we're going to go to verses 11 through 12. Okay. Now, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Okay. So have you ever wondered where the teaching on, on relics comes from, those that we saw at the on the Feast of All, All Saints when we had out on the altar? Um, this is one of the very ver Bible verses which um, uh, backs up that sort of uh, practice uh, of the Catholic faith. And we see that it is Paul's uh, handkerchief and other articles of his clothing which were um, the sort of instruments for healing. Now we need to keep in mind that in in the gospel and in this account of Acts with both Peter and Paul, it's not the articles themselves that heal, right? It's through the faith of the believer, these are certainly instruments by which God heals. Not Peter, not Paul, but God in Jesus and through the Spirit and then the belief of the face. This is going to be very opposed to the next, or the next account we're going to hear about the magicians is going to be very opposed to that. It's almost the polar opposite. There's more belief in the item than there is in the one that's doing the work. Okay. Uh, so let's go. There we have a, a healing uh, through articles of clothing. Now, to close this portion of the study, I want to now turn, uh, to take a kind of a different turn, to look at not so much comparing the works of the apostles to Jesus, but I want to compare the acts of apostles to apostles. So we're going to take a look at the work of Peter and the work of Paul and see how it's really the work of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit through them. Now, uh, first of all, it's helpful to know that the first 13 chapters of Acts primarily focus on Paul. I'm sorry, on Peter. And the last uh, 13 through 28, the last remaining portion of the Acts is going to focus primarily on Paul and how each one of these leaders formed or helped to develop the early church, all guided by the Spirit. So we're going to uh, see how each one of them encounters a magician and what they do. Now these are longer accounts, so I'm, I'm just going to touch on, on, for time's sake, on, on a brief portion of them. Okay, let's go to chapter 8, verses 9 through 24, and again, we'll touch on certain parts of that. Now a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. And all of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly, and saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. Now, he had a 
is going to amaze them with the magic. And what we're going to hear is that uh, Philip, whom kind of was the first person he was impressed by, was going to continue to boldly proclaim the kingdom of God until we get to verse um, 13, where Simon finally himself begins to believe in the work um, that he witnesses through Philip. And here we go. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed by the signs and great miracles that took place. So he's baptized and he continues to be awed by everything Philip does. Now, when the apostles heard that at Jerusalem had been Samaria accepted the word of God, they sent Peter to them. And the two went and prayed over them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, then Peter and John laid their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power, so that on anyone who I lay my hands, they might receive the Spirit. But Peter said to them, It's kind of harsh, but merited. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You will have no part or share in this gift, for your heart is not right before God. So this is the teaching on simony. You know, this, this sin, simony, is named after this magician who tries to buy grace, essentially. That's why we don't sell blessed articles. Usually you got to go to a store, purchase something, it's unblessed, then you bring it to a priest and then they bless it so that simply no confusion can come about. Um, likewise, the sacraments are not sold. You might give a donation to the church uh, in the weekly tithing or you might give a donation uh, on behalf of the church for you know sacramental preparation. But in terms of paying for the sacrament itself, we just don't do that simply because uh, it's a sin to try and buy grace. It's like me walking up to the Pope and saying, here, here's a hundred bucks. Why don't you ordain my friend? It's ridiculous. So um, enough of that. Let's go on to Paul. When in Luke, uh, we're going to go to chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. He's going to tell us about another magician that he encounters. Okay. Now, when they had gone through the whole line and as far as Paphros, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. So he's kind of amazed by the word of God, uh, similar to the way Simon was. But when the magician Elymas, for that is a translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, those those key words, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Okay. So likewise, he's going to go and he's going to uh, boldly proclaim the Lord until the pro is finally going to see what happens and they're going to believe too. So we have two apostles that witness to the faith of Christ against these two magicians in a very similar way. Okay, now a final example to kind of close this up is let's see how the word of God continues to spread um, through the apostles. First, we're going to take a look at Peter in chapter 12 and verses 16 through 19. First, keep in mind that Peter was put in jail, miraculously freed by an angel, and then he's going to uh, run and encounter somebody. And it should remind us of the scene of uh, uh, Jesus once he's been freed from the tomb and uh, he's gonna, well, he's gonna go into running with Mary and tell Mary, go and tell my brothers. So this should uh, be sort of familiar to us as well. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking and when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He mentioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. That's that whole tell my brother scene. Then he left and went to another place. When morning came, there was no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And now we're going to turn to Herod, who's the one who's been trying to kind of persecute them. And in this case, with Herod, um, we have a very funny saying that comes about that often gets overlooked. So I'm going to place emphasis on that because it's going to ulti his going against the gospel is ultimately going to lead to his death. And this shows how um, the gospel will be preached. Uh, with or without Herod. And so since Herod goes against it, well, here's what befalls him. Okay. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, so they came in him in body, and after winning over Blastus, the kingdom chamberlain, 
They asked for reconciliation because their country depended on the king's country for food. So Herod's going to go and put on royal robes, and he took the seat on his platform. And he delivered a public address to them, and then the people kept shouting, The voice of God and not of a mortal. And immediately, because he had not given glory to God, the angel of the Lord struck him down. And he was eaten by worms and died. It's hilarious. Eaten by worms and died. It's very matter of fact. So, But the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence. And then after completing the mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. And so here we have the transitioning from Peter to Paul in the end of chapter 12. Now Peter's uh, going to kind of move off stage and center stage is going to be Paul. And to kind of close this off, we're just going to hear the very end of the Acts of the Apostles where the story kind of concludes. Okay. Let it be known to you then that salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Then he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So Paul's in prison, ends in Rome. It doesn't sound to end on such a great note, but the kingdom of God continues to get proclaimed in the spirit. And so I hope you've enjoyed this, a kind of better understanding of how uh, the spirit uh this who proclaims the gospel through Jesus, is one with Jesus, and then through the two distinct leaders continues to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. So I hope you've enjoyed. On the last one, I'm going to give something uh, maybe at least challenging for myself a try. I'm going to try and do this Bible study live so that maybe we can even have a chance to answer some questions. Um, so I hope you enjoy and I uh, hope you like and share this and hope the, the guide is also of help to you. So if you have any comments or ideas, please add them. Um, so that we can better prepare for that next one, which will be here towards the end of the weekend, most likely Friday or Saturday. So may God bless you. I hope you enjoy.